Okay. So let me begin with this uh, question as everyone has addressed. It's not an issue whether small farmers are entrepreneurs or not. But if we are saying that being an entrepreneur has to be a market-based entrepreneur, then I have a problem with that statement. Because being enterprising and being an entrepreneur are two very different things. Almost every farmer is an enterprising person, but whether the farmer wants to be an entrepreneur or not is a question that uh, is far more uh, difficult. Secondly, if we are talking about market and in the context of small farmers, and if we think that small farming, and in that sense, peasant farming, I use the word peasant farming as a huge positive value, not as a negative value. From that sense, whether the market supports that kind of a peasant agriculture or it is a de detrimental to the peasant agriculture is another consideration we need to make. I think we can talk about it uh, more. So a small farmer, for me, would appreciate a market if the terms of trade was defined by the farmer and not by the market. And if the market represented the kind of values that the small farming agriculture represents. Otherwise, I think there is a huge divide and that divide can stay. So to me, what is the kind of uh, principles and values that uh, the agriculture, small farming agriculture in the global south represents? I, uh, I was asked to introduce myself. I take this particular opportunity. I have, I have been working with 5,000 very small women farmers in the semi-arid part of India for the last 25 years. And all these women are great uh, farmers. And therefore, working with them, everything I say comes from the kind of perspectives that they have given me over these years. The, the kind of agriculture that they would like to follow, that they would like to take with them, is the kind of agriculture that respects the earth principles, the principles of biodiversity, which Olivia has already talked about. It is very intrinsic that their kind of farming has two principles, ecological, ecological agriculture and biodiversity. Sometimes when we are sitting in places like this, one may sort of question whether this is a romanticism. But I would like to say that more than 100 million, please underline the uh, figure, more than 100 million farmers in India, basically those who come from the dryland part, which is about 65% of Indian farming landscape, and those who are from the indigenous belts and the hilly areas, they're all intrinsically ecological farmers, unless they are driven away from the ecological farming by the state, state policies and the state manipulations. So when they marry themselves with the market, invariably the markets don't have anything to do with either of these two principles. They have nothing to do with ecological agriculture, nor with biodiversity, and much less with biodiversity. We have seen the great going green market chains such as Sainsbury's or Tesco's, they have uh, organic uh, shelves in the market, but they are just organic. They are not ecological. They, are, they have no, nothing to do with biodiversity. In fact, they have moved farmers to become organic monoculturists when earlier farmers were, uh, were, were always together with ecological agriculture and biodiversity as the twin legs on which they walked. And in India, we have seen over the last 10 years or more since the neoliberalism took over, since the reforms agenda took over, we have seen a large number of small farmers given this dream that you can become enterprising agriculturists and moved into cash cropping. And I again want to emphasize another principle. The principle is that in the traditional agriculture, in the ecological peasant farming, there was no dichotomy between cash cropping and food cropping. Their crops were there. Part of it went to the market and part of it provided the food. There, were, there was no dichotomy whatsoever. It was the Green Revolution which started the monocultures. They made the monoculture cash crops and monoculture food crops, and that has been the curse of agriculture ever since. And these new farmers who started with the uh, uh, globalization and uh, neoliberalization policies of the Indian farming, they were all led down, led down the garden path, saying that at the end of it, you'll be great entrepreneurs in farming. 
And what is the result? In last 10 years, we have 250,000 farmers committing suicide in India. And invariably, 95% of these farmers are small farmers who have become enterprise, uh, who have tried to become entrepreneurs and they have uh, wedded themselves to the cash cropping monoculture pattern. As against this, lo look at one, one or two small examples, how the market has treacherously behaved with them. La early this year, we had the price of onion at 70 rupees a kilo. The whole uh, country went up in smokes because the country is with the uh, urban uh, consumers and not with the farmers. And within two or three weeks, the price crashed from 70 rupees a kilo to less than 20 rupees a kilo. And farmers had lost more than 75% of what they would have otherwise earned. Same with tomato. It started with 40 rupees, a huge furor uh, followed, and it fell down to one rupee, from 40 rupees to one rupee. So this is how market has been playing with the farmers. So how can farmers have anything to do with the kind of markets that we have today? So the, to think that markets can be fair is a huge, huge illusion. Fairness and markets are two different qualities altogether, and you cannot expect them to be the same. Therefore, to base a community and, and the development of a community, development of a segment of pop, population has nothing to do with fairness and market. It has to be somewhere else. So similarly, the, um, if, if you are looking at development as the underlying word in right base or market base, then we have to redefine development itself. And in India, we have seen then last 15 years or so, farmers, large farming uh, organizations, farmers groups, which used to, uh, which used to um, struggle for good markets, they've all gone round now. They have, they have started saying that it's not markets that we want. It is something more than market. And therefore, the principle which started in Bhutan, saying that, gross domestic happiness is more important for my people than the gross domestic product of my country. That has completely become a standard practice these days in the civil society arguments and pharma arguments. And many of you who are queued into this now know that this gross domestic happiness has moved, become a kind of a international principle and several things are coming. And my, as my friend Michel Pamber, who is sitting here, what we are seeking is less market and more civilization in our attempts to move ahead. A strong, vibrant peasant farming system. Here, I lose my, uh, I miss my pictures. My pictures would have said thousand words or more uh, when I'm saying this. This is an intrinsically biodiverse farming system. Why biodiverse farming system? For all the reasons it, it is, it, it takes away several risks from the farmers, and including the climate risks which Oliver uh, suggests. Last year, before Copenhagen, we did a community agenda on climate crisis, a community charter on climate crisis. We traveled around 13 different communities in India, far the communities, far, far the, the communities which are farther away from the markets and centers of power and hill communities, indigenous communities, pastoralists, fishers, all of them. And every one of them says that we can grapple with the climate crisis. Just leave it to us. You don't intervene as policymakers and think tanks and scientists. The more you intervene, the more the crisis would be for us. Because in our forestry, in our fishery, in our pastoralism, in our agriculture, we have principles which can grapple with any kind of change in climate. And we know how to deal with it. Therefore. This is what I'm trying to say that is farther away from the market arguments. And therefore, even, even uh, as, uh, as, as rights argument, I would say that we move beyond the uh, discourse of rights and move into a discourse of sovereignty. I'll come to that a little later. Last year, in India, we had a farmer's jury on agricultural research. And we had 30 farmers, very small, 50% of them being women, and 60% of them coming from the peasant backgrounds. They all sat down together and quizzed about 12 agricultural scientists, agricultural researchers, policy makers, etc. And at the end of it, they came up with a 22-point verdict, 
And in the 22-point verdict, the word market was nowhere to be see seen. That means their concerns were far beyond market. They were talking something else. And b after that, we had seven round tables with the farmers. And in each of these round tables, we took the verdict of the farmer's jury and placed before these farmers. And they were very, very uh, strong farmer leaders coming from different kinds of backgrounds. But in the farmer's uh, round tables, there were, I, I would say, five or six important points. One, when farmers decide on their cropping pattern, financial benefit should not be the sole consideration, number one. Number two, we must, they, are, they were trying to tell themselves because they all came from vibrant farming movements in the southern part of India, we must move beyond struggle for our survival. We must prioritize the survival of our environment and our environment and through that our survival. These are not uh, uh, dreamy-eyed, uh, romantic uh, environmentalists. They are strong, hard-headed farmers. But even they were saying that our, our survival can depend only on the survival of en our environment. Then they said something very interesting to the government of India. Keep farm produce and food products from the price rise index criteria. This, this was very precisely what the farmers wanted because once you start looking at the price rise index, then the farm producers will have a very negative effect. We had limited our movements until now only to farmers' rights. Now we will explore the enormous knowledge still rooted in our communities of farmers and fight for its protection. They said food sovereignty should be our goal. It is in food sovereignty that we can find our freedom and dignity. All research must promote local food sovereignty. Governments must strengthen farming as a holistic concept and not of individual crops. So they were absolutely challenging the very basis of agricultural research, which looks at individual crops and tries to look at one trait or half a trait and see how these traits can be improved. They were saying, don't do that. Look at the farming as a whole, not just with crops and fields, but much larger social and economic and cultural and uh, environmental environment of the uh, farming. So very, very profound statements. And in this, all these round tables, never was market discussed at any point of time. Vibri, have a couple of minutes. How many? Two. Two. You said you will warn me at three. So okay, you must three. give me a bonus of one. <laughs> <laughs> you can have three. Yeah. So I am, like I said, I am not arguing for rights as the basis for development. I am arguing for a much more beyond the sovereignty. And that's where the work that I have been privileged to do with this set of 5,000 women comes. We are there not talking about rights at all. We are talking about the community sovereignty. We are looking at a cycle of autonomies. And the autonomy starts with autonomy over food production, autonomy over seeds, autonomy over healthcare systems, autonomous market, and autonomous media. I would just touch up upon the autonomous market. This market, which where something like 3,000 women have been shareholders, has upheld the principle of what produces that it sells and from whom it buys. It's completely ecological crops. It is completely food crops. And having these two principles, and at every point of time going by that principle, and every year all the farmers sitting together and making a democratic decision on how much they should be sold and in what proportion these should be purchased, in last 10 years, 11 years since this market has begun, every year, every shareholder has made, has, has earned a dividend between 35% to 110%. So this has been a hugely successful market, though its basic principles are very promotive of biodiversity, very promotive of ecological agriculture. And every year, for one whole month, these farmers do a mobile biodiversity festival where they celebrate their biodiversity, the principles of ecology. So in an ocean where despair is being produced in the Indian farming landscape, these are the people who still maintain an oasis of hope and dignity. And that is because of their uh, uh, market and the kind of principles that they work. So it is if there is a market which can empower these kind of principles that the farmers uphold, small farmers uphold, for their survival, their dignity, and the survival of their environment, then that is the kind of market we would like to embrace, but not a market which is completely opposed to this principle. 
And lastly, I would like to recall with great fondness uh, the, my visit to Peru, the uh, barter markets in the Andean mountains. And that was, that had nothing to do with the market as we see it. And that's, its dynamism was something entirely different. The way the women spread their, uh, their, their shirts and received the uh, produce from the other farmer and the way they gave, the kind of love and spirituality that dominated it is something beyond the capacity of current discourses of development and market. So let's create a new world where that becomes the principle of market and not the narrow principles that our current market affords. Thank you.